Welcome, and welcome to Sage for This Age, your place in cyberspace where we search for truth and meaning in global politics. And welcome to another episode of the IR Theory interview series. My name is Jon Obey, and I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Global Political Studies at Malmö University. In this interview series, I interview IR scholars about their preferred theoretical perspectives. The idea is to get a brief account of why scholars appreciate a certain IR theory through a short interview. Today, I have the honor to interview another great scholar. Welcome, Siba Grovogu. Thank you, my friend. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, nice to uh, meet you again. Nice uh, to meet you again. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so before we start with the um, uh, questions about IR theory and post-colonial IR theory. Uh, would you please tell me about your scholarly background? Yes, my name is Siba Grovogi and I'm from Guinea, West Africa. Um, I actually did law initially in Guinea and, and I was judge, I practiced. Um, at some point, I decided that maybe the court was not good for me, and I worked a bit for an outfit created by the United Nations on transfer of technology, on technology transfers, and then I decided to go back to, to, go back to study and, and become a professor. Um, and um, this is actually a true story. Uh, when I was in college, um, and this is connected to why I did international relations, Somebody walked into my class one day and was talking about international law and international waterways. And he said, uh, whatever Kaiser Canal is now called, what used to be Kaiser Canal is German, it's in Germany. They don't call it Kaiser Canal anymore, I'm just forgetting this morning. Um, uh, Panama Canal belongs to Americans because the Americans pay for it. And Suez Canal is an international waterway. And I raised my hand and I said, I don't get it. The one in Germany is for the Germans because it's in Germany. He said, oh yeah, of course, yes. Uh, the one in Panama belongs to Americans because they dug it, yeah, of course. And Suez was an international until Nasser, and that was actually the comment, that Nasser just was not respectful of international law, he just changed it overnight, mm -hmm. leading to a Suez crisis. Mm -hmm. And I just decided there is something about international mm -hmm. law that needs our own intervention because this is this does not make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. and, and believe it or not, that's actually what began me thinking about international law, mm -hmm. thinking it as a space and international relations later as a space for all of us to try to figure out problems about this world because whatever it was, it was not right. Yeah. So basically the, the political aspect of international law triggered you to change the field. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's an interesting story. So, wh but where are you working now? I'm, I'm currently uh, teaching at Cornell University oh. in, in the US. Uh, I still teach international relations and I teach humanitarian law, uh, but I'm in the Department of Africana Studies. Hmm. And that has to do with the fact that uh, my current project are actually about um, African contribution to modern political thought. Mm. But okay. in, in the realm of international relations and law. Okay. So it's not um, uh, an IR department or a political science department proper? Well, I, I'm actually jointly appointed between um, uh, Africana. In, at Cornell, we have something called field. Okay. I am still in the field of government, which is what they call political science at Cornell, government. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just located in Africana studies. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you very much for that back background and that information. So... Uh, if we continue, um, I mean, you have researched the question of race in international theory and international law, and you have published a number of different works that engage in post-colonial critique. So if you were to choose two or, or three core post-colonial IR concepts, which ones would you choose and why? And some concepts that you have worked with as well, perhaps. Yes. Um, let me just say that um, I... Um, I use post-colonialism as foundation for thinking about the world today, but it is not post-colonial theory because I actually don't think that 
IR needs another theory. What I do know is what Amy Césaire and America Cabral and even Nelson Mandela taught me, which is that there is, in Amy Césaire's word, word l'après-colonialism, after colonialism, which is post-colonialism. And I think that even recently, Gayatri Spivak went to Sciences Po in Paris and recognized that the idea of what happens after empire and colonialism was originally French. It was formulated by the French. Now, there are people who think that there is a theory to be made of it, but for me, it's the human and time question after colonialism. It means that, that whether we like it or not, all our assumptions about people, places, wealth, subjectivity, as they were formulated on the empire and colonialism, are gone. We accept it or we don't. And if we accept it, then we have to work toward what that actually means, right? Mm. And I always trace it, that concept, I always trace it to not a, somebody from the third world, but from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 um, what is his name? Uh, uh, who wrote, uh, 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 who wrote the, the introduction to the, the Russia of the Earth? Uh, uh, Sartre. Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's too early here in the, in the US. Yeah. Jean-Paul Sartre, who said in the introduction to the Russia of the Earth, the first lines, the first line, mm. 50 years ago, the world was inhabited by 500 million citizens, by which he, he meant people in the West, in the North and 1.5 billion natives. Today, the natives have become citizens. And he was basically telling France and the rest of the West, and even people on the other side, that what Fanon represented, whether you bought his ideas or not, what he represented is that the natives now get to speak, and so we, we are in a different time. Empire is dead, colonialism is dead, and here we are. So, so would, would that boil down to a concept of, of citizenship or? No. Or, or, or. As I said, post-colonialism yeah. is actually, so post-colonialism here is a, is a world historical moment. Of course, there are many theories that correspond to that. And, and I'll get to the theories in a moment. Yeah, okay. What I want to say, and I'm going to actually comment on the theories. What I want to say is that uh, post-colonialism is actually, again, I return to it, the time and human question for us today. Mm. Right? And, 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 and that time is post-violence, post-colonial violence, post-Holocaust, post-Armenian post genocide, post-Nanjian, post all of those. Mm -hmm. Right? So that poses first the question of survival and violence, which is why violence is always... And, and, and ending it is always essential. Mm -hmm. And even though in international relations we don't pay attention to it, one of the longest debates at the United Nations when African countries became independent was demilitarization. Mm -hmm. Right? And the other question is justice. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and the third one is obviously citizenship, who belongs. And the third one is the question of law, what does law represent? Coolish norms, right? How we govern ourselves. And, and we have a lot of theories of post-colonialism, but they all come around to that. Now we may use words like subjectivity and positionality, and all, but it's, it's really coming down to those questions. And I prefer to keep it simple in my yeah, yeah. case. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. Why, um, why use jargon that perhaps is, um, yeah overly abstract or um, first year, first semester students might not grasp it directly. It's yeah. better to put it simple. Um, uh, true, I agree. But so then, then, then you actually mentioned uh, justice, uh, law or norms and citizenship, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah. And then uh, demilitarization. Would you say then that there is um, a normative element here uh, much more than an empirical element, or is that distinction uh, not really appropriate? No, it's not appropriate. Okay. It's not appropriate. Um, 
let me take the question of, of, of law, mm. right? Because that goes to government. The idea that human need law is actually universal. There's no society, I come from what they used to call stateless societies. Even in those societies, we had some yeah. forms of law. Yeah. People actually knew, like, you know, people knew boundaries. Yeah, certainly, yeah. The idea that we need that is actually not in dispute anywhere. What is in dispute is A, that we have a legislator who is above the law, and I, want, I don't want to get in, into Schmidt here, right? <laughs> the exception. Why not? <laughs> that, 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 you know, that there's somebody who's above the law and makes yeah. the law for everybody. Yeah. Right? Or whether the laws actually apply to all of us. And, and where that is very, come, has come up lately in Africa is the question of the International Court of Justice. I mean, mm. the International Criminal Court. Mm. 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 People who don't know, as Europeans like to characterize Africans, all of them as sort of misguided and not understanding. For many of us in Africa, scholars, if you, write, if you look at their writings, mm -hmm. it is not whether his Abre should have been tried. That is way not that. It is whether for one time in our life as human beings, we can have universal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. If we have uni universal jurisdiction, it means that everybody appears before the same court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not that Africans are going there. Those Africans who are going there, mm -hmm. I will not say this, or I I'll just tell your student that I'm actually joking here. But when, when I talk in Africa, I say, those Africans who are going to the ICC, if somebody wants the ropes to hang them, I'll give them the ropes. Mm. Because a lot of them are criminals. That, that mm. is not even, it's not in defense of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, right? no, 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 no. It, it is the idea of universality and universal jurisdiction. Yeah. So th there, there is a bias in the court, you would argue. Uh, or, or, or not, perhaps, it might not even be your argument, but the argument is that there is, a, there is a bias in the court and it's not universal because certain states, certain countries uh, would never ever uh, send their former heads of state uh, or their current heads of state uh, to that <laughs> well, court. There is that any other actually. person. Yeah. There is that actually, but it's, it's actually deeper than that. Okay. The question is, you see, if, if you want universal jurisdiction, then you have to define what the law is. What is actually a crime against humanity? Mm. Is it only when some Hamas fellow takes a bomb and goes blows up people, which mm -hmm. nobody should ever do? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that only that? Mm -hmm. Or is it something else? Mm. We have to specify what the law is intended to do. Then we get to the question of jurisdiction. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, something that you mentioned also relates to <clears throat> the fact that uh, some governments and the United States government now and, and, and Biden recently uh, um, said that uh, uh, what happened in, in, in the Ottoman Empire was, was a genocide. So he mentioned the Armenian genocide, yeah. um, uh, but uh, not mentioning the um, Native American genocide or, or or slavery as a genocide, yeah. or or any yeah. other um, yeah. uh, event in history that has occurred in the United States proper, so to speak. Uh, but it's very easy to mention other genocides. Yeah, which leads me to the question of justice. Mm. A lot of people in the West, and that you see that today in the question of reparation in America and around the world, a lot of people think that justice has to be retributive. The idea of truth and reconciliation as emanated in South Africa and before South Africa, even in Argentina, was not that you hold everybody who's ever committed something, right? It's now I'm going to go to my, um, to my, to my, uh, uh, um, to my Catholic roots, uh, which is, it's the sin, not the sinner. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. is going to tell Turks that they are all responsible for whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 1915, mm -hmm. but that has to be established. It's something for, for, for slavery and colonial. It just has to be established. It's mm. not. But nobody, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, but we have to establish if, in fact, the end is to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Which is why I, I don't know why Turkey was so adamant that nobody should. It was a genocide. I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah, I mean, maybe that is, um, uh, maybe we shouldn't go too deep into that issue. It, it was just, I mean, an example yeah, that yeah, came yeah. to no, my no, mind. I, really. I stopped there, actually. Yeah. I, I yeah. realized that, yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned something interesting. Why, why do we not need any more IR theories? Um, um, disciplines, at least since the 17th century, and in social sciences, disciplines are about domains of knowledge. And so we have something called international relations over there, and we want to understand it. So in our disciplines, because of dispositions, we want to theorize. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a point where the domains of knowledge we're interested in actually matter. But our disciplines, because, for instance, in international relations, we don't seem to get out of the sense that, uh, I mean, Ole Weaver said that long time ago before, <laughs> right, long, long time ago, mm -hmm. about the sociology of international relations. Mm -hmm. right? it, it becomes tied to particular countries, particular foreign policies, particular interests, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. But international relations is not the same as foreign policy, even the foreign policy of larger countries. That domain of relationship is far greater than foreign policy concerns. And what my problem is, is not that we don't need theory, it is that we actually need to specify what that thing has become or what it is, right? So we throw things around like GDP and national economies and rule of law. I mean, that is fine, but we know rule of law. I'm not actually sure. Mm. Which is for speciality we don't know, mm. right? We, we, talk, we talk about the primacy of the state. The state is a very new instrument. If you take capitalism, for instance, all the instruments of capital, the most important one that made capital global, for instance, the letter of credit, mm. it emanated at a time when people had no national identity, they had no national borders, the people who met in the Strait of Malacca who didn't speak one another's language, Chinese, whatever, but things that are as intangible as trust mm -hmm. is what made the letter of credit, the letter of credit possible. Mm -hmm. This paper you take somewhere, you go somewhere, you give to somebody and say, somebody sent me, apparently, if they recognize what you are describing, they think that they actually can trust you to give you that money. Mm -hmm. Nobody had anybody's ID, etc. Mm. Is, yeah. is it more that the theories are too narrow? Yes. Uh, that, that we haven't specified the domain of knowledge yeah. enough to engage in theory making, mm. right? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Um, uh, but then if we um, relate uh, to some of the work that you have been uh, engaged in, uh, your work on international law specifically, um, how would and international institutions, how would uh, a post-colonial perspective, if I still try to, to try to use that yeah, label, yeah, po yeah, post-colonial, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, post-colonialism, how would a post-colonial perspective or post-colonialism differ in its critique of international institutions and international law from, let's say, real, from, let's say, a realist critique? Um, let me just back up a bit to tell you that, that where I come from, from my post-colonial perspective, I actually think that I'm the realist. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I like that. Right? Yeah. Because I have already considered that we all operate in the world blind in one eye. Blind in one eye, sorry. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't mean that we're actually blind. It's not even a question of perspective. It simply means that you, you look, your position tells you what side of the moon to look at. So yes, nobody's perfect and, and everybody is a sinner. I just said that and et cetera, mm -hmm. right? But what I do know is that the policies that we have embarked upon, I now talk about, I come to America specifically. 
except for World War I and World War II, and perhaps the American, uh, the War of 1812. There are two things you can say about American wars. Every single one of them, except those three, was predicated on a lie. The war that started, the war of 1988 that gave the US Cuba, the Philippines, and et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. about the ship and something blowing, it was never attacked. Uh, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin mm -hmm. resolution was predicated on a lie. Mm -hmm. The Iraq war, mm -hmm. a lie. Mm. and etc right and i'm not telling i'm not talking about i'm not saying that policymakers are liars mm. right and maybe a lie is not the proper thing it's a falsehood right this is the thing the problem is twofold one it's very difficult to agi agi adjudicate relations between humans let alone between states so the idea that that weapons are the ultimate recourse is actually mistaken. In fact, language and law is what we have after we use the weapons. The weapons are not the last we use. Right? So people might come into conflict. In post-colonial context, we don't deny that. Mm. But it's precisely because we have conflict that we have language and law and norms. Uh, but the, what we call realism in the discipline puts the guns after. So, right? so, yeah, so, so and, you, and it has never worked. Look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, look at Libya. Look, I mean, it never works. Mm. And we keep doing it. Yes. Mm. Well, but, uh, but a realist might actually say that uh, those wars are not really realist wars. They are more liberal internationalist wars. <laughs> um, and uh, a realist would refrain from those interventions, given how many realists that have been vocal about not intervening in, in Vietnam and Iraq and so on. Thank you. And, and that's bringing back to your, to your question about yeah. theory, yeah. right? Realism, philosophical realism, is different from IR realism. Mm. Right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what I was thinking about the theory. So mm. our, our discipline has become so narrow that we think realism is those people who, who want to tell us why we go to war and how wars are won and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. No. Mm. So exactly, realism is actually what, right? So when I read Thucydides mm -hmm. and von Clausewitz, I read them very differently than American realists do. Mm. We don't, it's like we don't even see the same thing. Mm. So I actually read all the fundamental texts of so-called realism, but mm. what I see philosophical realism is not what they see. Mm. Right? And that's why I was saying that we, 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 we emphasize the theory making too much, we forget actually what the concepts are and what they are trying to get at and what the human, human time questions are okay. and how we should respond to one another. Okay, but, but, but then what the difference, if we take a post-colonial, what difference would, for instance, the concept of, of race do when it comes to international institutions that realists perhaps would not uh, take into account? Um, the, the problem of race, and, and, and I have be, I have, I've been telling people lately that when I talk about race personally, I make a difference between the epithet, like the N-word, and the curse, yeah. what it does to the mind, to our conception of the world. What race does to our conception of the world is what really matters to me, mm. right? Mm. And that is why I always say that my discussion of race is really about the human question. Can we put that to rest? Mm. But we can't unless we see how it has shaped our imaginaries, mm. how it has shaped how we see, understand the world, how it has shaped even how we we hear and we read, even in theory. And that right? is why post-colonialism is important, right? Yes. Mm. Uh, right? Be, yeah, because it's no other dimension that really brings that uh, out. And, and I yeah. think that, 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 that's what it is. And, 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 and so, which is why today I'm in Africana. Mm. I'll just give you an example. From Diogenes, eight century, uh, eight, four centuries after Diogenes, Every single major Greek philosopher spent time in Africa. None of them went to Paris or Sweden where you are. But the Swedes and the, and the French say that Aristotle and Cicero are the traditions and not those of Africans. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not just that it's hubris, 
But it is that we, we, we forget, hey, what those Africans were thinking, what the Greeks were seeking in Africa, what th that discourse was about, and what does that tell us about how we should understand the world today? Because if, if we are, that's, if we are all, we all occupy this planet, mm -hmm. we lose a lot by not seeing other people as cognizant, mm -hmm. as thinking, mm -hmm. and et cetera. And every thought system, every iteration and concept, and et cetera, and gives us more space to think about solutions in the world. So, so, so would, if I, if I um, uh, relate that to another concept, um, I mean, given your example of Greek philosophy, uh, w w w what you're saying here, would that mean that Greek philosophy or, or the Greek, Greek history, Greek tradition is, is not really uh, something that Europeans can claim? It's, 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 a, it's, um, uni it's universal knowledge, so to speak. It's part of a universal heritage, but we need to provincialize uh, Europe, perhaps. Uh, we used, to, we used to, to, to put into context what part of Greece, Greek thought has become part of Euro European inheritance after the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment? Yeah. Because it's not all there is to it. Yeah. It's also to say that Greek thought was made as part of a universal process about thinking about a particular time, mm. right? And, and I say the same thing about uh, uh, Diderot, the father of the encyclopedia. In his voyage, Bougainville, his, uh, uh, his uh, voyage to Bougainville, mm -hmm. but, right? His primary interlocutor is Oru, is the old black Tahitian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If Diderot, if that Tahitian who is black mm -hmm. had been white, Diderot would have been Plato and that guy would have been Socrates. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you mean, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's not just to say me too, it's actually to say, there's so much to learn about mm. life mm. as human mm. that we, we just, this idea of race and is just stupid. And we have to say where, how it enters into our thought and how to dispense with it so we can go to the human question. But, but how does that then relate to, uh, this might be a very um, insular or this might be a very small example. I don't really know, to be honest. But, uh, I, but I've heard, and, and, if we, and if we read and if we follow uh, the news and the discussions and so on, um, there has been this uh, uh, demand or plea to um, erase certain um, philosophers, uh, Greek philosophers or certain European scholars from the curriculum. Um, how does that question relate to what you are saying? Do you see what I'm trying to say here? I, I'm yes. not very familiar with the topic, to be honest. No, no, no. But I know but, that it is going on. No, 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 no. Um, but I don't know how... how uh, I, I go back to, yeah. I go back to, again, um, this, what people now call cancel, cancel culture yeah, yeah, yeah. is American. It's not post-colonial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is interesting. So it's, it's an American <laughs> culture, but it's, it's not post-colonial uh, perspective. Nelson Mandela, when he was going to jail, mm. the last sentence, three sentences of his statement before the court, before he was sent to jail, mm. he said, I will fight. He looked at the judge and he said, I will fight. I have fought white domination. And then he turned slightly back to look at his backers in the back. He said, I will fight black domination. Mm. It's an idea I'm willing to die for. Which means that for him, it was not domination of black or white. It was the idea of domination, mm. right? Mm. Number one. Number two, uh, uh, Amilcar Cabral said to his Portuguese communist interlocutors, mm. our struggle is against colonialism, not even the colonizer. Because at the end of colonialism, the colonizer to become citizen. Our ideas is not to villainize everybody, is to stop certain kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. But how can I say, and this is America Cabral speaking now through me, I'm channeling America Cabral now. Mm -hmm. How do I say, give me a voice and then silence another? Mm -hmm. Even if I don't like it, how can I say, give me a voice? 
and then silence another. Mm. That is American liberal, liberal dissembling we mm. see here about canceling everything. Okay. Which sadly has now reached South, South Africa too. Okay. But it, 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 for some of us, it's actually, that's not the main problem. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, that actually requires um, uh, a whole nother session, <laughs> that whole topic. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, if we move on, um, so in terms of policy relevance, if we say something about policy relevance, how would um, post-colonial IR theory inform policy? Um, it informs policy thusly. If you are looking simply of this is post-colonial and this is how it does, to, you, have, you have missed it. Um, I'm going to give you three examples quickly. Uh, a man called Teli Jallo, who was ambassador of Guinea at the United Nations during the Congo crisis. A man called Amadou Matarmbo, who was UNESCO's director when America and Britain left UNESCO and Boutros Boutros Ghali. Right? The debate, the debate about Congo, as Teli Jallo was, <clears throat> sorry, Teli Jallo was debating it, was really where the self-determination was a concept that was different from the rights, the right of people to dispose of themselves. Under the charter of the League of Nations, it was the right of people to dispose of themselves, to choose what camp they want to be in. Uh, in Congo, that's the choice they gave Congolese. Are you pro-Soviet, pro-American, pro-whatever, all of mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Teddy Yellow says, we are beyond the right of people to dispose of themselves. The right of self-determination is actually different. So even a concept as simple as self-determination, we actually understand them profoundly differently. Mm -hmm. And so basically, right, what he was telling the West then was actually at that time, was that, that the right of people to self-determination is just that. They decide. And we have to be comfortable with that, mm -hmm. with that right? Mm -hmm. and, and at the United Nations, that has been, even has not been resolved today, what people understand by self-determination. Because the countries at, at the Security Council still understand this thing to be the right of people to dispose of themselves, of Libyans to decide who we like, of Iraqis to decide who we, based on who we like or don't like. Right? Mm. You go to Matarmbo. Matarmbo was the question of the universal and universalism. Since the beginning of empire, Europeans have been very, very focused on universalism. In the post-colonial world, the, that debate that UNESCO, what it showed is that we are interested in the question of the universal. Can we decide the, first what we all need before we start making decisions? And, and, and in the West, even people who do normative theory in America always began by what we know is already universal. No, you declared those universal before I became a citizen. Mm -hmm. And so the policies have to be about what should universal be today? Mm. To my knowledge, there's only one person who understood that very sharply in American history. It was Eleanor Roosevelt. Please ask your student to read the, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It does not say human rights in the preamble. It doesn't say human. It doesn't say person. It doesn't say citizen. All these lawyers in San Francisco were debating, should it be human? Should it be person? Should it be blah, the Arab saying this and et cetera? Obviously, Charles Malik of Lebanon and René Cassin, who was a Jew who had escaped, obviously, slaughter uh, during World War II, and, and, and Malik, who was an Arab but Christian, they were the ones sharing this thing and everybody was fighting. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, gentlemen, it's going to be everyone. The preamble of the United Nations Charter says, everyone has the right to everyone, everyone. That's the English version though. It says everyone, mm -hmm. right? And what he was allowing for is that the question of human, we see it differently in different cultures. And what, that's what I tell you that I'm always suspicious of theory. We don't, we don't begin with theory. We begin with specifying what we are 
interested in. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question of the universal should come first before universalism. Universalism is an edict. Edict. Right? And, and we sit there and say, everybody's going to do this. Yeah, you know, this is what we have declared human rights. That is not interesting. And it's actually in the post-colonial world, that smacks too much like colonial, colonialism again. It's somebody telling you what civilization is, what proper, what is mm. not proper. Mm. Right? And, and, and Boutros Ghali basically said, uh, and that's why they told him he only had one term. When uh, the crisis in Bosnia happened, is he said, where were we when Rwanda happened? Mm -hmm. Right? And because some are white, some are black. Um, right? And, and so that thing Boutros, Boutros Ghali was saying there, mm -hmm. it has a long, long, long tradition in, in African thought. Mm -hmm. It's an American who gave me the best formulation for that. His name is Alexander Cromo. Mm -hmm. And you know how he called it? No partial public sympathy. We can have all our private sympathies. That's fine. We like some, we don't like some. Mm -hmm. But in the public square, we shouldn't have mm -hmm. private sympathy. We should not have partial sympathies. Mm -hmm. No partial public mm -hmm. sympathy. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, I, I like that. I like that. Um, I, I never heard that before. I yeah. really like that. Yeah. But so when you no partial to... public. No partial public. Policy? Sympathy. Sympathy. No partial public sympathy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We, we can yeah. function as humans if we yeah. do that. Yeah. So that is a consciously post colonial concept. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, continue, yeah. please. Yeah. No, no, it yeah. goes against yeah. that's the question. That's the difference between the universal, which we have to. If you and I have to talk, we have to first agree on the language. You are speaking English. Mm. I don't know that you are a native English speaker. I'm certainly not. But we are I, I'm not. English. I'm definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, no. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Let us continue so we don't. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we are short on time, actually. So yeah. uh, the last question. Um, uh, yeah, before we leave, um, any advice to uh, fellow IR students, uh, not just at Malmö University, but uh, all over the world? Uh, lately, I've had, I'm sure they'll, they'll read somewhere else, they'll feel bored. But I have one, two questions, the f I mean, advice. Yeah. One is that to pay attention to what brought about Vatican II, the idea of teaching the Bible in vernaculars. Before Vatican II, the Jesuits find themselves on street corners around the world, mm -hmm. reading the Bible in Latin, and nobody was paying attention to them. Yeah. And so the Pope said, you know, for people to listen to us, we actually have to make sense to them. We have to say it in their languages. Yeah. That is what students in the West have to know. There's too much dissension in the world today, and it's not all because people over there don't understand us properly. Mm. It might be sometimes that they understand you too well. We have gone to slavery, colonialism, and et cetera, et cetera. It's not incomprehension. Some of it is. Some of yeah. it is not. Right? Yeah. And so we should learn actually to pay attention to that. Yeah. Uh, the adjoining advice to that is uh, Adley Stevenson, American politician from Illinois who ran for president, who said at the United Nations that he had come to an epiphany, which is that in the world today, everybody needs aid. And he said, the West needs a hearing aid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my second advice would be to people uh, in Africa, principally, and in, in the rest of the so-called global south, right? And that advice is, that advice is that nobody, nobody on this planet has ever thought about thought that has not occurred to somebody else. But some of them just happen to have put them on paper and articulate them and etc. I have no business a counseling them. Secondly, Aristotle, Plato are in my traditions. They spoke when they wrote it. They were speaking to my traditions, and those traditions took roots in Africa. No major religion in this world was created without Africans. 
Simon of Cyrene from Cyrenica, Libya, carried Jesus' cross. Read the Bible, Simon of Cyrene. And he was the last person to see Jesus and one of the people on that scene who was the most sympathetic to him. And in fact, there's no account in the Bible that he misspoke or was rude or did something untoward toward Jesus. Mm -hmm. The last person to empathize Jesus' plight was an African. In Book, of Acts, in Book of Acts, right? There is in, um, when Philippos is meeting uh, the um, Ethiopian or the, yeah. the, the yeah. Kushite, maybe it was rather. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first Muanzen, the first person to, to, to take the call of the Prophet Muhammad to believe in this thing, which in, in, in Islamic jurisprudence is said to be one of the canons that people who witnessed Jesus' I mean, Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad's life mm -hmm. and wrote about it. The, his first Muanzen, the first person to call to prayer for, for Prophet Muhammad was, was Bilal al Habashi meaning Bilal, the, the, the Abyssinian, mm -hmm. he was an African, mm -hmm. right? So I tell this to Africans, Africa has never been disconnected from the world. The theories constructed after the, the, enlightenment, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment wiped Africans out. Mm -hmm. and, and our response is actually not to say, dispense with those things. Mm -hmm. Our response should be, uh, what were we talking about before the conversion was so rudely interrupted by slavery, colonialism, and etc.? Mm -hmm. Can we go back to those conversations? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do, which means that I, I actually take all of those people, are, are my traditions as they are those of the Swedes, mm -hmm. because yeah. they were human. Mm -hmm. Nobody said only Swedes can read me. Yeah, no, no. And then if we go, <laughs> even if we go, if we go further back, I mean, the examples you mentioned, uh, um, or interesting, but also the if we go even further back in history, uh, yeah. how many of the ancient Greek philosophers have actually spent considerable time in in Egypt as well? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, and and yeah, uh, okay. Um, that's really interesting. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, um, and thank you very much for the the conversation. Uh, hey, thank you very much, and 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 I really hope your student realized that. Uh, 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 the time and human question are essential. And, and if we take that seriously, then we have to aspire to a post-colonial world. Yeah. I stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. My pleasure.